I'm glad the children don't have to sit through this a second time. But I've been blessed by their singing. And that children's story was really dead on. I'm glad to be here with you this morning. I don't get a chance to preach the same thing twice in one morning. So this is kind of different for me. I want to thank all those who were involved in getting me to come here this morning. Months ago, Pastor Guzzo called me, and then Brother Frank picked it up. The number of emails, and like I said earlier, quite a few months ago, he was asking me, what am I going to speak about? I said, I got a wedding to plan. I don't have time to think about that. When I get there, I'll think about it. But then others picked up and, and, you know, I'm here and you're here this morning. And I'm glad that I'm here. And I'm not going to say in spite of the rain because I'm also glad for the rain. God sends the blessings. We need the rain. You may not think you need it, but somebody else is happy that it's raining this morning. So we are thankful for what the Lord is sending. It's my privilege um, to be here and I, I, I pray that our Father above will smile on us and that wherever he nudges you and me, that we respond and see him do for us what we hadn't thought possible. It's an awesome task to stand between the porch and the altar, but I know that his Holy Spirit is here among us. As you've noticed, the title is Children, the Tale of Two Families. I'd have just a little more time than I had earlier, but not much. Um, you have heard if the scripture reading so ably read, and we're going to focus a while there. But I'll take a few minutes a, later, a little later to take you somewhere else. Families established by God at creation were designed to be reflections of his relationship with us, his church. Family, home, is to be the place where we come to knowing that we are loved, respected, cherished, valued and appreciated and where we do the same for others from the youngest baby to the oldest enfeebled grandma grandpa great aunt whomever those who are able and those who are not so able it's a place where we come where we love to be we at the end of the work day at the end of the school day we can't wait to get home that's what families and homes are supposed to be like our homes are supposed to be the oases in the desert land of sin where we sojourn amidst the stress, violence, and corruption of all stripes. Join with me as we pray. Father, come near to us as we delve into your word today. Please send us a message, however small, that will remind us of where we may have fallen short of your will for our personal lives and for the lives of those in our families. Show us what we need to do to fall in line with your will for us and our children. And we thank you for your word, which never fails, your word, which never changes, your word, which is a light, and your word, which makes us light, your word, which makes us salt, your word, which is power in our mouths. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible contains multiple stories of families. All had their share of problems, challenges, family secrets, and flaws. They're no different from our families today. I'm here to tell us that what we are going through in our families or what we have gone through in our families of origin were not new under the sun. What I just need to remind you of is we serve a God who is able to erase all the hurt and pain and you name it that some of us have experienced and are experiencing in our families. There are always results for our actions. And there are always consequences too. We live at a time when we have, however, the stories of people in the Bible where we can learn from them and not have to make those mistakes. 
we can take corrective action today. We shall look at a few families and see what we glean from them. So, two families, two attitudes, two outcome. On the one hand, Hannah with El El Elkanah at some level, and their boy. And on the other hand, we have the priest Eli and his two sons. Hannah's barrenness is really put in stark reality for us as soon as we start reading the first chapter of 1 Samuel. Every year, the people would leave their cities and go to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. The problem in Elkanah's life was that one wife, Penina, was fruitful. The other wife, Hannah, was not. She had no children. But Hannah wanted nothing more than to bear a son for her husband. In fact, her grief was so great that one year she refused to eat anything when they went up to the temple. Instead, she went inside the temple to pray and agonize with God because, as verse 10 says in that first chapter, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. She made a vow to the Lord to give him back the child for whom she was pleading with him. God, compassionate as he is always, saw it fit to answer her prayer as she had requested it. Unlike many of us who make promises and break them, make promises we don't intend to keep, Hannah kept her promise. She carefully weaned her child, preparing him for service in the temple. This was her way of giving him back to the Lord. This example teaches me the importance of giving back my children to God and not to hold them, not hold on to them as if I own them. You don't own your children, neither do I. In fact, I've found that sometimes in our lives, we hold our children so close to us that God is squeezed out. And when some of those same children disappoint us, we ask God why and our faith falters. They aren't really yours, you see. They're God's. They're given to us as a gift. As we're told in Psalm 127 verse 3, they are a gift from the Lord. Blessed is he who has them. And blessed are us when we have them young. Some of us don't have them too early in our lives. But we are not told a lot about how Hannah went about weaning little Samuel, nor even what she taught him. But we do know that both Hannah and Elkanah were on the same page with respect to what was going to happen to the little boy. And finally, Hannah made the trip to Shiloh and presented her son to the priest, saying to him in verse 26, I am the woman who stood by you here. Remember he thought she was drunk? Praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition. Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And then they worshipped. So two things here. Do we give back our children to the Lord? And how important is worship in the general tone of our family? I don't mean wake them up at 5 o'clock and you have to have family worship. I mean just breaking out in singing, just breaking out in worship any time of the day when we are together. And how often do we actually worship when there's something we need to be bringing to the Father? Note that in further chapters, this is said of Samuel. For example, in chapter 2, 11, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. In verse 18 of chapter 2, we are told, but Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Verse 26, and the child Samuel grew in stature, and in favor both with the Lord 
and men. Now I have a question for you. Have you heard that verse anywhere else? Where? Tell me where and tell me what it says. Luke 2, what verse? All these children in um, Adventure and Pathfinders need to know that. Luke 2, 52 says, And Jesus increased with wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The, these are the only two times this appears in the Bible. So I think Samuel was in good company. Only Jesus was that said of also in the Bible. It is fair then to conclude that Samuel was taught obedience, among other things, by the time he was weaned by his mom. This is one quality that seems to flow through the various references to him. Remember, he got up several times, went to Eli, and he said, I didn't call you. Every time he heard the voice, he got up. And, that was obedience. That's just one example. By contrast, consider the case of Eli and his sons. The names of Eli's sons, who were also priests, we're told were Hophni and Phineas. These two sons of Eli, in contrast to Samuel, are described in uncomplimentary terms. Chapter 2, 12 calls them corrupt and says they did not know the Lord. The sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. That was a said of those two young. Who were they? They were priests. And it says they were corrupt and they did not know the Lord. And as well, the sin of these young priests was very great before the Lord. I wanted to pay attention to that. Verse 17 says, but Samuel. There was always that contrast between younger Samuel and these young priests who were supposed to be standing between the people and God. Stand they did, but interfering with the flow. Now, let us focus for a while on parental response because when we speak of parents, we got to cover the base. When we speak of families, we need to cover the basis. Elkanah and Hannah prepared Samuel for life in the temple. And after giving him back to the Lord, they continued visiting, you know, doing the usual annual sacrifice. But every time they went, I'm sure they touched base with him. And they, the mother made him a little, a little pretty little coat and took him. As he grew, he would need, you know, more, um, more clothing and larger clothing. So this was um, Elkanah and Hannah. I would believe that even though they only saw him once a year in the home, prayer was offered over young Samuel, far away from home, to cover him, that God would be with him. Do we do that for our children who are not at home? Do we do that for other children, other people's children? Because these children are all ours, are all yours. Do you pray over them? It says, by contrast, <laughs> that Eli's sons, and they give us several examples which, which I just went through. We do not read much of Eli's early or later interactions with his sons. I mean early, like when his sons were boys. And I wonder, did his work as a priest keep him too busy? to provide fatherly care and guidance for his young boys. Do you allow the work that you have to do, mom or dad, to keep you so busy that you are not involved in the training, in the guidance of your young boys and girls? And you men who fathered boys, they especially need you. Some people, you know, say, my, my mom was my father. A woman cannot be a father because you don't know what it is to be a man. There is something that comes from a male that a woman cannot give. Do we nurture our children? And so, we are told of Eli that all the people kept complaining to him about his sons, the priest. So he couldn't pretend that he didn't know things were going on. 
You read that they were committing sins of a sexual nature right there at the door of the temple with the women. Right there, they were blatant. They had no respect for God. So he couldn't pretend ignorance. Yes, he did remonstrate them, as you heard um, in the scripture reading. But his mistake was, repeatedly, he failed to take action. He failed to take action. What was the result? Oh, that's not talking again. They didn't take him seriously. They carried right on doing what they had been doing, committing adultery at the door of the temple and violating the, the sacrificial system. We know the end of the story because when God had a talk with Samuel, in Samuel 3 verse 13, God says, For I have told him, meaning Eli, that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, meaning he knows what's going on. And I am judging him because his sons make themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And he did nothing about it. And he took no action. So what can we learn from these two family situations? I'll go through as quickly as I can. One, it is important very early in our children's lives to instill the love of God and the love for God. Number two, teaching children obedience very early is extremely essential. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9 as an example. Three, our esteemed positions, whether in, in society or in the church, does not excuse us from deliberately teaching children the values that need to be instilled in them. It's not just going to happen. And teaching values requires that we spend time teaching them. They will hear us and they will see us. And what we say needs to match what we are telling them. There is no substitute for this. And it's not enough to simply be in the same house together on the same apartment, but that person in his room and that person locked away in her room and I don't mind. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what, how you teach values. Because sometimes our children are locked away in their rooms and we think, okay, they're out of trouble, but the devil is right in the room because of what they're exposed to on the internet and whatever information highway they have access to. So we need to remember that the enemy seeks to destroy all and he respects no one. If he can destroy your children, that's exactly what he's going to do. If he can destroy you by using your children, he will do it. He is on a roll. He is on a roll. It is in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 where we are warned to resist the devil who walks about, help me, like a roaring lion. Now, does that make him a lion? Have you thought about it? It says the devil walks about like a roaring lion. Does that make him a lion? Nope. Who is the true lion? The lion of the tribe of Judah is my Jesus. And my Jesus has conquered them all. So the enemy can come like a lion, making noise to make us afraid. But in Luke 10, 19, Jesus tells his disciples, Behold, I have given you the authority to trample on scorpions and on serpents and over all the power of the enemy. So why do we walk down here scared of what the devil is doing? He cannot touch us if we walk in God. In other words, nothing can come to our lives if God didn't permit it. And we need to teach our children that very early to know how we, this scripture in, in 1 Peter says, resist him. Because he's doing that to all the brethren in all the world. That's his job. The lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5. 5. He is the one who has given us authority to walk victorious, happy Christians. So I, looking down at you, I should see pleasant faces. Moving right along. 
Another lesson we can learn from these two families is we must speak out against evil. When we see it in our children, we nip it in the bud. We don't allow it to continue. You and I as parents cannot afford to be passive when our children engage in wrongdoing. Worse yet to cover up for their wrongdoing and say they didn't do it. My child could not have done that. Really? Justice must prevail and your children must see that you are parents of principle. So when a child comes complaining to you, that's not fair, that's not fair. Don't just say you're whining. It may be not fair for true. And you need to look into it and take some action. Are you with me? And you don't have children who don't have children yet? Listen up. Listen up. So, you will not allow your children to victimize others. You will tell them, no, that's not allowed. Throwing a tantrum is not going to make you not do what you need to do as a parent either. Hmm? When they learn early in their lives to have their own way, this is what happens. They are undermining your authority and they are learning to disregard what you say. And they are also learning, because you are the first God that they know, they are learning to disregard and to dishonor and disrespect the authority of God in heaven. If you don't believe me, look again at the story of Hophni and Phineas who were priests before the people. There are some young ones here. I have a little bit for you too. An important lesson you need to learn, younger ones and young ones, is that you are not too young to serve the Lord and to resist evil. You are not too young. Because one day you will stand before the throne of God too to answer for what you've done in your life. You see the case of Samuel. He was obedient. There are people around you who have attitudes, whether in the home or in school or even in church. And sometimes you wish you could be bad like them. Resist that evil. Resist. It's not nice. You know what I mean? Obedience to what is right is never a weakness. I want you to know that, young ones. It shows that you are a person of character, one on whose shoulders God will delight to place important responsibilities as you grow older. That's what happened to Samuel. Another lesson you can learn is that God expects you to do what is right. He is the one who teaches us what is right from wrong. And he made a promise to your parents in Isaiah 54, 13 and 14. You could do your Bible very quickly or write it down. Isaiah 54, 13 and 14 says, Parents, all your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. When I found that verse a couple of years ago, I shouted, Hallelujah, children, you're covered. You're covered. Your peace is great. So it doesn't matter what you're going on, what you're going through. Don't get like this. God has given you authority to trample on it. So trample on it in Jesus' name. Because you're covered and your peace shall be great. And I say, bless the Lord for that truth. You have seen and will continue to see young ones, older sisters, older brothers, maybe cousins, even your parents do wrong things. They may even invite you to participate. They may call you a snitch if you say you're going to tell. They may call you other names, but that doesn't matter. You stand, and when you stand, it doesn't matter how bony you are, how light you are, or how heavy you are. Stand with all the weight you have. I'm going to look for a couple minutes at another two families. Genesis 18, 19, God in considering Abraham when he was about to do what he had to do with Sodom and Gomorrah said, you know what, I'll let him in on, on, on the action. I'll tell him what I'm about to do. You know what God said of Abraham? For I have known him. 
Genesis 18, 19, in order that he could make a man his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. I wish that God can say that about me. The big question here is whether we have introduced our children and others in our household to Christ. In this command, God is saying that he had confidence that Abraham would live what he said. He would walk the talk and he would lead his family, not push them, not bulldoze them, not coerce them, not use force and rigidity, but he'll use his spirit, God's spirit, to lead his children and his household after him. But contrast this with the house of David. Uh -huh. Quickly, David was a man of war. A great man of valor. You know the stories of David. He killed by the thousands while Saul was sung to say he only killed by the hundreds. And you know that didn't sit well with Saul. Hmm. David, the celebrated man of war and skilled musician. David, who is known as a man after God's own heart. We can't take that from him. He, however had major challenges as a leader in his family. In 2 Samuel, starting from chapter 13 and go right through for several chapters, you have the story of his woeful parenting. The scene I'm choosing to, for today is Absalom. Absalom and his half-brother Amnon. You remember the story of Amnon, lusted after his half-sister, and his, his friend, Jonadab, I think his name, you know, kind of schemed with him to get her there, and then he raped her. Hmm. Please note that when David heard that his son had raped his daughter, Second Samuel 13, 21, all that is said of David was that he was angry. But he took no action against the incestuous act of his son, Amnon. There's no record that shows he even went to Tamar or sent to get her to comfort his daughter. Parents, listen up. There are things you know that you take no action about. Some of you. Parents, sometimes within the family, when injustice is done, we sweep the matter under the carpet. Amnon, resentful of his sister's rape, tells her in 1320, he's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And we often say that to our children, especially our girls, when sexual things have been done against them. He is the first elder, or he's the one who provides us transportation and so on. So we can't do anything against it. Some of you can relate, some of you can't. It's okay. He said, don't worry. But he knew that he had a plan of murder in his heart. How often family victims of the spiteful acts of others are told to keep quiet for whatever reasons they are given. Finally, Absalom has his day. He gets Amnon murdered. And the same friend that set up the thing between Amnon and his wife is the one when David thought all his son has been killed, Run to David and said, no, 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 don't worry. Only Amnon was, Amnon was killed. I see a pattern of minimizing the worth of an individual. The story doesn't end here. Absalom runs from the presence of his father, King David, who is grief-stricken over the death of Amnon and wants to avenge him because this is yet another son that has died. Note that for three years, Absalom was exiled in Geshur, and he was only allowed back after Joab used a wise woman to confront um, King David about how he was dealing with Absalom. Verse 24 of chapter 13. Note too that when the message struck home and David allowed his son back, the scripture tells us that although Absalom was back, two years passed before David even looked on his son. Finally, when confronted again, indirectly by Absalom, because remember Absalom burnt the fields of Joab, and then Joab came, what man, what do you do that for? 
He said, well, I've been here this long. Get me to my father. So eventually, David allowed him, I condescended to allow him in his presence up at, in Jerusalem, up top at Jerusalem, you know. We are told in verse 32 that Absalom bowed himself before the king. Then the king kissed Absalom. No word of greeting, no word of reconciliation, nothing said. So do you wonder at the resentment that Absalom harbored in his heart that boiled over to the point of treason against his father? Don't you think that Absalom was longing for his dad to say something? He never said anything. Not before, not now, not to Tamar, not to Absalom. But they too had been going through their grief. I'm talking of Absalom and Tamar. Parents, remember, there are times your children need you to sympathize and empathize with them when they're going through matters in their lives. Keeping silent is not necessarily the best thing. Go to them. Ask them how they're doing, how you can help, because they will tell you. So we are speaking of families today. I've touched on four families. Pick any two that you want to represent yours. I trust that you use those who have the, the sense, well, you know, the grace to know whom to turn to. So, a few questions. What legacy are you leaving for your children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren who come behind you? And may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. You know that song? May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. God is faithful to his faithful. But his word also shows us that there are intergenerational sins. And if we don't stop sin in that generation, it's going to continue to a next generation. Whether it's a sin of abuse, alcoholism, whatever it is, it's going to continue through the generations. God says here that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. But we are told, I'm reading from Numbers 14, 18. But he'll show mercy to thousands of them that love him. I don't want my grandfather's and great-grandfather's sin to fall on me nor my children. So I stand in the gap there to trust my father to stay that, leave that in the past. We're not continuing it in their generation. What would your children say of the home in which you raise them? Happy, pleasant, kind, compassionate, or punitive, hard, double standard, and you can add to it. Can they say that both by your words and example, you introduce them to a Jesus who was loving and welcoming rather than a Jesus who was punitive? Because sometimes that's all our children get, even on Sabbath. Do they know that God loves them and welcomes them with open arms even when they make mistakes? We are told in Psalm 145, 4, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. One generation to another, it means me to my children, you to your children. We got to pass it on. So if today you are convicted about some area of life in your parenting, it's not too late to make amends. Some of you may need to call a son, a daughter, a niece, a nephew, an ex something and make it right. Yeah? And this wrong may have happened years and years back. It's not too late. Because there are many people out there waiting for the healing of an apology. Of an apology from you because you know that you've done something to them. Some of us among here, inside here, need to start treating our spouse right so that our children will grow up trusting and hopeful about life, about love, and about God. I don't have the time to tell you some of the sad stories I get among university students when they come there, and I go, I hold my head, what are we doing in our homes to these children? And then we dare say they don't have anything to worry about. They're, we are fortunate they're even standing and half sane. But we get a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, and a lot of trauma that we have to deal with, and it goes back to how they were treated from little. Um, by the way, 
when things are not going too well between mom and dad, if we have that privilege of that in the home, well, even if they don't live together, this is what happened. Children take responsibility for the not good things that are happening in life and sometimes develop illnesses just to keep them occupied otherwise. So be careful what we're doing in front of our children. The best gift we can give our children is to have a loving, caring, kind relationship with their other parent because it makes them feel secure. I know I've run out of time, but I started a little later. They had promised me a little more time, so I'm taking it. I won't keep it too much longer. I would like to remind us all that we need to understand that Jesus was sent by God the Father to show us how to live by the Spirit and not after the flesh. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 6? Can't live after the flesh. We have to live after the Spirit. I love a verse I found a few years ago. You know, I'm discovering my Bible. I'm realizing the quarterly is good, but it's not enough. If you read your word, you go, what, what? And sometimes I tell my husband, Charles, boy, I look this. <laughs> I said, Jesus called illness a demon. He said, oh, I mean, no, I mean, you know, you, it got doctors to take. Jesus called it a demon. Anyway, never mind, I can't go. <laughs> Colossians 3.3. 3. If you have your Bible, take it quickly, because I don't have too much more to tell you. Only one more paragraph, but I have four texts in it. Colossians 3, 3 says, but you died. What do you mean by you died? The Adam of me died. That sinful part of me died. But you died. But then it goes on to say, you have it. Somebody tell me what it says. But your life is hid with Christ. Okay, so the old us died, right? Because so when we come to him, we are new creation. Some of us keep going back to that old person. Those old habits. Those are not signs of new creation. Okay? When we go back to the old things we need to do, we have not been converted. That is known. God doesn't use, didn't use any part of our old man to recreate us. And I don't know when we're going to get that message. But it's a point I need to make. He said, but you died. The old man died. And your life, your new life, is hid with Christ in God. So where are you? If Satan needs to get to you, what does he have to do? He has to go to Christ and then go to God. You got double protection. So why are we afraid of him? We need to learn to rebuke him. I died, the old ermine died, and my new life is hid with Christ in God. And if we knew that, we'll treat people in the family differently. We wouldn't treat this slower child badly and keep comparing that child with the brighter child. Okay, guys, that's for this afternoon. It says we are new creatures. Please walk in the spirit. We all need the anointing of the spirit. So let us take up our cross daily and teach our children what it is to take up their, their cross daily. You know, I got to share this from the heart of a parent. One of the things I so thank God for is that the last couple of years, as my children have grown older, I have been emphasizing a relationship with God, with Christ. Because I realize that many of us in our church make the mistake of introducing them to doctrines and to rules of the church where they have never met Jesus. And when things happen in their lives, they leave the church because there's no true heart connection there. So, most of all, I want you, as you take up your cross and take a lift in your homes and families, just like Job did before God, to remember Matthew 18, verse 6, as you deal with children. Jesus says, Matthew 18, verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung. You young one, millstone is something heavy, heavy, heavy that will keep it down, okay? If a millstone were hung around his neck 
and he was drowned in the depths of the sea. And as if Matthew 18, 6 were not enough, we read it two more places, one of which is Mark 9, 42. What is that saying? We need to clear the highway in our homes and families for Jesus to really live there. And my blessing that I confer on all of you sitting before me or standing before me is that that will be the experience or the experience you're already having will be enhanced knowing or having participated in this service this morning. God died for everyone, young or old, black or white, fat or bony. I don't care what we, we call people, what names we call people to make them feel that they're not valued. God died for all. And if you truly believe that, I wouldn't have a job. Because God is Father of all. Let us believe it and let us trust Him. May God bless your families. Amen.